Good morning, everybody. My name is Thomas Halverson, and I'm the Associate Director for Corporate and Foundation Relations at the Middle East Institute. I'd like to welcome you all to another session in MEI's virtual briefing series, which today will focus on the ties between different hostile actors in the Red Sea. Since October, MEI has been working hard to provide you with cutting edge analysis on various dimensions of the escalating tensions in the Middle East. And this morning, I'm delighted to welcome Marette Mabrook, MEI Senior Fellow and Founding Director of the Egypt and Horn of Africa program, as well as Guled Ahmed, uh, an MEI non-resident scholar and energy entrepreneur from Somalia. Thank you both for agreeing to join us, in, uh, for agreeing to join us this, uh, this, this morning for a unique discussion about the Red Sea, which is a topic that continues to be very interesting to many of our listeners on the call. When we get to the question and answer session uh, portion of today's briefing, you can indicate you'd like to ask a question using the raise hand function on Zoom. Please keep your hand raised until I call and unmute you, uh, state your name and affiliation, and direct your question to one or both of our panelists on the call today. Before we get to that, however, I'd first like to turn to you, Marette and Guled, and invite you both to provide our listeners with some fresh insight on the ongoing issues in the Red Sea. Obviously, the Houthis' military operations and counterstrikes against them have been well documented in the headlines that we're all following. But other hostile actors like Al Shabaab, the Somali terrorist organization with ties to Al Qaeda, and pirate networks operating out of the Horn of Africa also pose credible threats to shipping. Uh, I hope our discussion today will allow for further clarity on how the Houthis are just one part of a larger, more long-term puzzle when it comes to Red Sea security. Gulad, I'd like to turn to you first. Can you tell us some more about these hostile actors in the Red Sea besides the Houthis? Who are they? What's their current agenda? How have they been collaborating with the Houthis since October 7th? And what's the end game? What do they stand to gain? Uh, thanks, Thomas, for uh, having me, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll try to be brief uh, to set the framework for the discussion and, and upcoming questions. Uh, um, so just to start with uh, about the Red Sea, uh, lately the the news will be more focused on more on Red Sea and the Houthis, and you, you write about that there are other bad actors that have not been reported or underreported in the Red Sea area. So I'll start with uh, uh, the relationship between Al Shabab and Houthis and uh, Butlan pirates, uh, which has started, I, I believe, in early December when I kind of tweeted firstly, uh, and basically the way it came was um, the region, a small region in Somaliland, uh, Seoul region, uh, has been uh, ongoing crisis for the last one year, and. Uh, Al Shabab, uh, since they have pushed from the southern Somalia, that moved to this area and became uh, Al Shabab safe haven. So it started with uh, a small tribe that partnered with uh, uh, Houthis and then the Al Shabab, and then eventually it transpired to a partnership between the Butlan part, uh, pirates, which is in the region Butlan, which is autonomous, and the pirates and the uh, Butlan pirates and Al Shabab and Houthis. And now you have these non-state actors uh, partnering together. And basically, this is uh, this network has been there for a while, but there was no such collaboration at this time. So what created now is uh, mostly uh, is related to the, the war in, in Gaza. And the uh, other part is the Houthis, who are uh, actually located in two parts of the Red Sea, uh, I'll say one on the Red Sea side and one on the Gulf of Berbera side. So for them to facilitate their illicit activities and, and the pirates uh, and also the attack on, on the maritime ships, they need some kind of a partnership to collaborate. And, and one of the uh, bad actors they've got, uh, some of the bad actors they're working with was the Butlan Pirates and Al-Shabaab. And basically what, what, how this partnership came, uh, I know they don't have any ideology, uh, I mean, uh, relationship, but the whole thing came is uh, mostly related to economy. Um, as you know, Al Shabab has lost ground, a lot of ground in Somalia lately. Uh, for the past year, lost uh, part of its uh, revenue generation, extortion revenue. Uh, Al Shabab uh, is uh, revenue it runs to be more than uh, close to, uh, if it's not one billion dollar. Similarly, um, Houthis also make about close to two billion dollars. 
these two entities, so Al Shabab was looking for a way to get back to uh, uh, to generate some revenue, and also the uh, the Houthis was looking some partnership to help them to facilitate their activities. So basically, what the Putland Pirates was helping them is to locate some of these ships that go th through the Gulf of uh, Aden which is the most dangerous area than the Red Sea. And reason what I mean by that Red Sea area, you have two, uh, uh, it's a narrow uh, channel. On one side, you have Saudi and, 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 and Yemen. Um, on the other side, you have Eritrea, Sudan, Egypt, and Djibouti, and part of Somaliland. So it's much little bit better than when you compare to this side of the Gulf of Aden, because those there are several stable regions. Here you have uh, Somaliland, which is a uh, stable, democratic, uh, but unrecognized uh, de jure state. And then you have the Putland Pirates, which is part of the Somalia, which has been an uh, ongoing crisis for a long time. This is a place where the Houthis and Iranians have been shipping um, illegal weapons and illegal fuel for almost the uh, last decade that ne never been addressed for a while. Uh, if you look, go back to the uh, Secretary of Treasury, uh, website, 95% uh, of the sanctioned individuals and businessmen came from the Butland region, and none has been done by either the U.S. government or the Somali government. So this has been going on for a while. So uh, one, uh, the first time I have reported uh, the Telegraph uh, news pick it up and showed that there's a connection between the pirates uh, and, uh, and 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 Al Shabab uh, and Houthis. And then I think uh, on somewhere uh, December uh, uh, 27, I believe, so also the the national news of uh, UAE picked it up. Uh, the there was actually uh, this partnership was uh, sharing the revenue, uh, whatever the booty comes in, and also uh, splitting between forty percent and to sixty percent. So uh, the maritime trade now became more uh, trade now. As you know, Gulf of Berbera uh, or Aden, 12% uh, of the global trade or close to $1 trillion passed through. 30% uh, of uh, the uh, European Union uh, energy goes through. And some other elements that a lot of people are not paying attention is uh, there are 14 fiber optical cables that go underneath the Gulf of Berbera. And the Red Sea, you have 17 uh, fiber cables that go under the tree. These all are under threat. And when you look at it in general, and also uh, some of these uh, bad actors that lately came, you know, non-state actors, mostly Al Shabaab, and uh, what helped them is uh, recent policies that has been happening uh, change, whether it's a UN Security Council or the U.S. government. Uh, uh, for example, if I give you, in 2018 and 2020, you had uh, basically Iran, uh, who has uh, the arms embargo has been lifted, uh, the, expired, and the U.N. Security Council haven't done anything about that. In 2000, uh, basically, uh, in 2018, you have Eritrea, who has been lifted the embargo army, and nothing has been done. In 2000. 22 uh, November, uh, the piracy sanctions of Somalia has expired and has not been renewed. In 2023 December, uh, Somalia arms embargo has been lifted, which was really a bad move for UN Security uh, Council. So all of these things are also contributing to this area. In addition, also the other uh, bad actors, uh, state actors, whether China and Iran also is contributing to this region instability as well. So I'll, I'll Stop there. Thanks. Hey, thanks so much. <clears throat> thanks so much, Gulet. It's been great. It's great to have you on the call. And I'm sure we're going to hear more from you as we get questions in later in the session. But now I'd like to turn to you, Marat. Can you paint a picture, give us an update on shipping in the Red Sea right now more broadly and what some countries in the region are doing to address the problem, especially countries like Egypt, who are losing um, Suez revenue as a result of a lot of this instability? So uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, shipping. So I think uh, everyone understands that shipping has been affected by what's happening in the Red Sea at the moment. But um, I think the, the political ramifications are, are, I think we're going to keep hearing more about them. So um, 
the mess started when the Houthis, um, in, uh, allegedly in support of the Palestinian being attacked by um, Israel, uh, decided to start um, attacking ships in the Red Sea that were in any way connected with Israel. Um, they're now also attacking uh, US and UK ships uh, um, because those have started bombing places in uh, in Yemen. That This is just the, the short version. The longer version now um, is that this has had a huge, huge effect on shipping for a couple of reasons. Now, um, Yemen controls the uh, Bebel el Mandeb. Bebel el Mandeb is a little choke point through which almost a third of the world's global containers pass. All right. It's about 12 percent of all global trade. And to get to the Suez Canal, you have to go through this choke point, uh, this choke point. So this is what the issue is. If you wish to avoid that, which a lot of companies, over 13 companies have, have stopped doing it. One of the largest being Maersk. I don't know if we have any Maersk on the call, but um, they'll know that they, they ceased operations after starting, stopping when they were attacked starting again and then stopping again. Um, there are some companies that are continuing to uh, to go through, uh, mostly French companies. They are being guided by the uh, um, by the French Navy. Um, but it, 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 we'll get to the multinational uh, force uh, at the moment. The problem is, if you do not go through the Red Sea, then you have to go around um, all the way around Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope, which chunks on 10 to two weeks extra, raising fuel costs, uh, uh, raising time, which also means money. But and the, the weather is is quite dangerous. Um, so uh, it becomes a, a logistical nightmare because it also mm. winds up snaring and holding up supply chains. Now. This has already resulted, if if you were um, in the market for um, a Volvo or a Tesla, you're not getting it anytime soon. They shut down their production lines or they have suspended their production lines because of this. OK, um, and we're going to see that a lot more now. Now, the problem is shipping rates have also increased. OK, um, partly because. Uh, the rates and the costs have gone up because there are fewer empty ships to empty container ships to use because they're taking a long time to go around the Cape of Good Hope. So fewer ships, but also the cost has gone through the roof, basically, because if you're continuing to go through the Red Sea, then you need fairly costly war insurance, which is something that is very specialized, only happens out of a group of people in, in London, I believe. Um, and and that can raise the cost to, in some cases, almost 1% of the value of the cargo. It's generally around 0.6, 0.7, but it can go up to about 1%, which means that if you're a cargo ship carrying 200 million, uh, uh, um, 200 million in, uh, um, uh, uh, in cargo, you're going to be chunking on about 1.4 million in that insurance. Now, the U.S. Uh, has led, uh, is leading a multinational uh, um, force to um, protect shipping uh, in the Red Sea. Um, I think, if I recall correctly, it's Bahrain, the U.S., the U.K., France, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, Norway, and the Seychelles. So far, that multinational force has not helped bring prices down, and I honestly don't think it's going to. I think the situation is going to become significantly more complicated because you want to bear in mind that whereas the, the main reason for the Houthis doing this now, because, I mean, they've been quiet for the last you know three years, I think, um, is because of uh, the, the continued onslaught on Gaza. It does not hurt that it helps burnish their credibility at home among some people. Uh, I mean, I have no doubt that that figures into it, but that is the thing. In fact, in the insurance, some insurance companies are uh, requiring that uh, the companies that they insure have to carry something that says not connected with Israel and after the US-UK bombings, not connected with US or UK. Now, um, you have ups and downs. On the one hand, eventually this is going to drive prices up enormously. And that's a problem because 
in uh, throughout most of Europe um, and in, in the US, the economies aren't growing as fast as people would like them to be. And as a result, consumer demand is slow. So manufacturers and shippers have a choice. Either you can, uh, uh, um, you can pass this cost on to the customer, which is not really going to work because consumer demand is slow, or because consumer demand is slow, you can eat that cost and cut into your profit margins. So it's bad news all around. Some countries are getting hit worse than others. You you mentioned Egypt. Um, Egypt, of course, hosts the Suez Canal, where fully 12% of all global traffic is to uh, pass. Egypt's Suez Canal traffic is down over 40% um, this January compared to the same period last year. That would be terrible news at any time. It is even worse news now because Egypt is currently in its worst economic crisis in I don't know, the last 50, 60 years. Uh, inflation is through the roof. It's about 33%. Um, growth has uh, the growth predictions have dropped from about 3.9% to about 3.5%. Uh, Moody's recently downgraded Egypt from stable to, to negative. Um, and the, the pound is currently artificially uh, uh, held, but is expected to drop to about 40 pounds against the dollar. Um, uh, by June of this year and possibly 43 to June of next year. So, and you want to remember a large part of this crunch is the fact that Egypt just doesn't have uh, a hard currency, doesn't have enough currency to meet its needs. And again, Egypt is heavily indebted. Um, Egypt is second only to Argentina in the amount of debt it holds to, uh, um, to, to uh, foreign lenders. Um, and um, uh, it, much of the money that it has goes towards servicing that debt. So it's just one hit after another. Um, why is this important? Basically because the security and stability of Egypt is essential to the region, right? The, the region without a stable Egypt is, is just is just like this. I mean, if you think the Middle East is interesting now, I mean, God forbid you have an unstable Egypt. Um, and the, oddly enough, the I mean, it, Israel and Egypt have a solid relationship, uh, you know, since 1977. And I, I think part of the short-sightedness of, of the current government in Israel is that it, is carrying out actions that it does not realize how much it is likely to destabilize Israel. And the security of Israel is inextricably linked to that of Egypt. So um, the entire situation is complicated and getting more complicated by the day, but I'll stop there so as to take questions. Great, thank you so much, Maret uh, and Guled. Now that we've had the opportunity to hear a brief word from both our guests, I'd like to open the discussion up to all of you on the call. To ask a question, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. Keep your hand raised until I call and unmute you, and kindly state your name and affiliation and direct your question to one or both of our scholars on the call. Questions can also be submitted using the Q&A box on Zoom. As we wait for some questions to come in from our listeners, I'll start off with one. From what you've both presented, it sounds like there's some early signs here that Red Sea security is a very complex and much more long-term issue than I think anybody would really like. What are some indicators, and I'd like to hear from both of you, what are some indicators we can hear of um, that we can look out for to measure worsening or improving conditions in the Red Sea um, in the short and in the long term? Marette, maybe we start with you and then we can go sure. to Brad. Sure. I, look, um, honestly, the indicators are at the moment for the Red Sea are inextricably linked to what's happening with Israel and Palestine. If you see uh, an improvement on that situation and and the the urgency, I mean, it's becoming more urgent by the day. Okay. If you see an improvement on that situation, then um, it will be significantly more difficult for the Houthis to continue to, to make this claim. So they are going to have to pipe matters down. It also, by the way, isn't particularly... Uh, um, 
sustainable for them that, that's what's happening, even though it's not as dangerous as other places. I, for example, insurance um, for the uh, in the Black Sea, in Russia and Ukraine, is three times as high, basically because the Russians do a better job of pounding ships. Um, but uh, uh, for us to start seeing any improvement on this, any return on uh, uh, on normal shipping rates, you're going to have to see an improvement in what's happening in Israel and Palestine. The other problem that you might want to look out for is that um, some people may start using the longer route anyway, uh, um, because th there are other advantages to that, and we can come back to them later. I don't want to take up too much time. But that could be problematic as well, that you could start seeing a shift in uh, shipping patterns. Yeah, that's great. Gulid, would you like to add anything, especially on um, sort of indicators from how Al-Shabaab and, and the Puntland Pirates are, are, are working with the Houthis at all? Yeah, um, just to highlight, um, just to underline the the, uh, the situation in the Red Sea uh, improving, I think, uh, we should focus uh, definitely, you know, the war in Israel uh, with the Gaza probably in the next two, three months probably will my end. Uh, the hostages might be released and, you know, um, definitely your uh, Amazon uh, uh, delivery or Walmart delivery will be on time. All those things can happen in the next two. Those are the improving things that might be seen in the near future. Now, but the Houthis case is totally different. Um, and this is something that uh, needs uh, serious, uh, you know, measures and actions to be taken. And and reason I'm saying is that the on side, the side of Gulf of uh, Aden, you have Yemen, which is uh, quite an uh, you know weak or failed state, and then you have on the other side, uh, you know, ninety percent of that coast on is. Uh, uh, Man run by uh, Somaliland, a uh, country that's not recognized politically. Recently, if you uh, listen to, there was an MOU uh, memorandum understanding uh, uh, deal between Ethiopia and Somaliland, which has created a new tension uh, because Ethiopia want to have a maritime access, and and in in exchange they would recognize Somaliland. And that created a new tension. And, and I think uh, this is something that needs to be paid attention. Uh, Somalia definitely is, is a country, but is a weak state to fail state uh, uh, status. So the question is, do you want to solve this problem? And Houthis will be there. So the next phase of the Houthis, when uh, the war al Gaza finish, is they're going to become the al-Shabaab of the, you know, basically of the, uh, the maritime and reason I'm saying is they're going to start. Uh, uh, they will be emboldened. They become. Uh, they will start new extortions. Uh, eventually, they will be calling the ships and say, "Hey, you know, ship number one, you know, you need to pay up the extortion. You will be fine." And just like you've seen, uh, I don't know, five years ago, there was hackers who were hacking the banks, right? And then they will, uh, you know, basically um, you know, take extortion from the banks and U.S. government or the EU couldn't do anything about it. And this has been going on. So the ex uh, it is now with alliance with Al-Shabaab and, and the lack of recognition of, say, uh, you know, country like um, uh, Somaliland and and the lack of a political solution for Yemen case, right? Uh, you know, U.S. government inconsistent policies of, you know, in 2021, uh, Biden administration lifted the, uh, you know, uh, terrorist list from uh, Houthis, and now we are relisting them. Uh, and and the worst part is we give them, uh, you know, um, some kind of a, a one month break to uh, to realize those uh, sanctions to realize. So all of those things, I think uh, what needs to be paid attention, I think the improvement case will be if uh, Biden administration bring more sanctions to Al-Shabaab targeting Houthis more uh, and especially pay attention to this uh, Butlan region pirates. Iran is trying to expand and with through Houthis and Al-Shabaab, Iran is already uh, doing uh, illegal uranium mining in one of the regions in Somalia. So all of these things have not paid attention. Uh, seems to be the uh, current the, uh, administration, Biden, has not taken concrete steps to uh, hold them accountable and, and sanction them. And I think um, in the future, we will see 
uh, Houthis more emboldened and, and asking extortions to the global trade. And what worries me more is if there is no protection, especially the um, uh, the fiber optics cables that go through that area. We're talking about 14 to 17 uh, fiber optic cables. We're talking about the, you know, the global financial system going through. Uh, the global energy is going through this area. You know, uh, eventually Houthis will shift uh, their area of an extent to Arabian Sea. So now we're talking about the Arabian Sea is a part of the northern part of the Indian Ocean. Uh, as you know, Indian Ocean, pretty much 70 or 80 percent of the global uh, uh, energy goes through that. And uh, say 20 to 30 percent of that plus the 10 and 30 percent of the global. So you're talking about almost 40 percent of the global energy can be impacted in the long run. And we're talking about two point five trillion dollars of uh, global trade of the oil uh, energy. We're talking about 25 percent, uh, 25 trillion of the global financial could be impacted if nothing has been done. So so the uh, I mean, those are the things that could go worsen if there is no concrete measures taken by the uh, whether the uh, the Western allies or, or the uh, regional uh, Gulf countries. Hi, Marit, did you want to add anything there? I did actually just um, on top of that, um, on top of that breakdown, it, just something very, 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 very fast. Um, uh, Gulen has outlined the ways in which it could, uh, things could get worse. Um, I think he's right about absolutely everything, but also, we want to bear in mind that A, um, the current multinational force that we are seeing in the Red Sea doesn't appear to be uh, doesn't appear to be uh, uh, having any effect. Um, it, it isn't it doesn't appear to be making uh, things safer. And the other thing is, uh, Gulen mentioned India. Um, I think you know I'm sure people everyone's paying attention to to um, India's meteor meteoric rise. But um, India is a nuclear power that is not going to take kindly, I think, to um, to having its its trade tampered with. Um, the Chinese have shown uh, um, much restraint. I, I mean, as I pointed out I, earlier, I mentioned Volvo and Tesla, and of course, you know, the Volvo is majority owned by the Chinese. Um, but I think there is a potential for various actors to start taking matters into their own hands and things could get hmm. very, very complicated. Thanks for that, Marat. Uh, we have a question here in our Q&A chat box from Jerry Cook. He says, what do you see the impact of Ethiopia's recent acquisition of a port to the Red Sea will have on navigation and shipping? Angula, do you want to start there and maybe Marat? No, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that the a recent uh, um, MOU deal between Tobia and, and, and Somaliland, uh, kind of open new tension, but at the same time, there's a positive impact if somebody looked at it. As you know, Tobia has a 120 million who are a population who are geographically, um, you know, prison, so don't have access to maritime. So this is one of the reasons uh, Tobia is pushing that. And I think there is a misinformation about this people, uh, especially uh, governments of Somalia who were pushing this narrative that Ethiopia is going to annex, uh, you know, part of Somalia, which they have no sovereignty over it for the last 30 years, uh, you know, Somaliland is a de jure state. But uh, basically, Somaliland government is exchanging for recognition because the last 30 years, they've been, you know, they have their own government, currency, passport, you name it, and they have uh, one person, one vote democracy. And, and they were the first country in the world that had done parametric data, uh, you know, for voting. So uh, they exchanging a lease of a small portion, 20 kilometers of their land for a uh, Navy base with uh, Ethiopia. Now, if a uh, country like uh, Ethiopia comes in as part of and have a seat of, in the discussion of the Red Sea, I think that should be seen as a, or welcomed as a sign of a positive. And here's why I say, because Ethiopia at least is a is a country might have some uh, you know domestic issue uh, definitely, but at least is a is a country that can be uh, reliable to wage war against uh, you know the Houthis or can contribute the allies 
And I think that is something needs to be looked at it. When you look back, the there was a um, Somalian Partnership Act, which the the Senate uh, have wanted to pass through the as part of the national uh, uh, NDA, but somehow uh, you know um, Biden administration uh, NSA team and and the State Department kind of lobbied hard to cancel. Today they could have really, if you look at that NDA the Senate, uh, it it was saying that. Uh, the Somalian has to be partnered with the maritime security, uh, with the Department of Defense, and and we need to look out the uh, bad actors like Iran, China, who are destabilizing that region. And actually, all the things they were saying uh, back in you know last year is now happening. So I think some of the things could have been avoided. So now, I think there's a huge opportunity to partner with Ethiopia on the Red Sea. I think, and that needs to be looked at it positively. If we can allow. If U.S. have you know see China as a foe uh, and is partnering uh, you know piracy fight against in in the Red Sea, why can't you allow Ethiopia to be part of the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aden? And I think that's something to be looked at. It already you, uh, Ethiopia is contributing peace uh, and security in Somalia. They have twenty one thousand. Uh, army inside Somalia. They are helping and fighting against Al Shabaab. So why why not be part of uh, with a Somalian and land? partnership, if no recognition, at least to be uh, considered. I think this is a good sign to be looked at it, rather than seeing it as a high tension. That's great. I, I will just I will just say, uh, normally I, I agree with um, Goled on just about everything. Um, uh, and he's brilliant at what he does, but I, I do think that letting Ethiopia, which does not have access to the Red Sea, have a uh, a say on Red Sea matters sets up a precedent where you have countries that should not, I mean, I, I don't think that China should uh, be as heavily involved in having say as it is. And I do think that allowing countries that do not have access to those particular resources sets up a whole set of truly complicated uh, uh, diplomatic and foreign uh, um, relations that, that, I mean, just myers that have to be navigated. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, I agree with him on everything. I agree that, it, you know, that Ethiopia is already fighting in Shabeb in other places. I agree on everything, but I am very, very wary of letting, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't think the U.S. should be involved, um, you know, in, in matters that are definitely tangential importance, but not a direct importance. So I am very wary of that situation. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to dig into that a little bit deeper. I think we've sort of skirted around the issue of China, but I think it's worth having a, a more of a direct conversation about it. I've heard there are Iranian media outlets reporting today that there have been backroom talks between Iranian ministers and the Chinese uh, on the situation in the Red Sea and the Houthis' actions and what Iran can do to try and um, help reel them back. Uh, Marat, you said you're weary of Chinese intervention, but is there any is there any role that China should be playing as a global power to try and resolve this international issue that's affecting international commerce? So um, I, I th I'm sorry if it wasn't clear. Um, wary, not 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 weary. My my apologies. Um, China is directly involved because it has so much trade. I don't think that China has the amount of influence that people think it does. Um, I, I honestly think that with the the last and um, the the, fa the the famous um, Iran Saudi uh, Sa uh, Iran Saudi agreement that you know China was supposed to have engineered. I actually think it sort of stepped in uh, near the end when a lot of the hard work had been done. So I'm not sure that it has as much influence as people think it does, but it is definitely present in a way that is not always to the advantage of everyone else. In this particular case, it has an enormous amount of commerce. And um, when you say uh, 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 to see if Iran can pull back the Houthis, uh, I mean, you know, Gulen probably knows more, but I, I think that there is an excellent chance that if Iran wants to rein in the Houthis, the Houthis will be reined in. Mm. So um, I think, I mean, at the very least, I think that China in this particular instance probably has significantly more influence than the United States does because of its position with the actors. It, China tends to maintain more of a, a, a 
not neutral, but it doesn't take sides as many. In this particular case, China has come down on uh, the side of, uh, uh, has has at least uh, asked um, repeatedly for a ceasefire in, in Gaza, which makes it, which puts it in a better position to uh, discuss these issues with the Iranians. But um, I, I also think that perhaps the, the influence of China is, I mean, perhaps overstated a little bit because people worry. Um, but yeah, that's just my opinion. Gulet might feel differently. Yeah. Gulet, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And also, I know China is very involved, heavily involved in Africa as well. So any diplomatic power that they have or influence they have, I'd love if you have any insight on that. That'd be great. So China, uh, for the last two years, have been uh, pretty much trying to counter or imitate what the United States does. Uh, for example, in 2020, I wrote an article about the emboldened uh, Horn Africa axis and then in, in Middle East Institute. And I've talked about that the Biden administration to consider uh, Horn Africa a special envoy. And I think this was the first time I've been done. But uh, so China, uh, for the first time, also assigned a Horn Africa special envoy. So it's kind of, you can see, it's trying to imitate. It's not their area of uh, expertise, but they're trying to learn and see how the people act, uh, try to explore or exploit the, uh, you know, uh, political differences uh, between, for example, when they try to involve Iran and so, uh, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, right? <clears throat> yeah, so they're trying to, in, in trying to influence, but China has stepped up its aggression in, in Africa a little bit more. Uh, they used to have a policy of non-interference. Uh, case example, I'll tell you, uh, in Somalia, uh, there's a small district called uh, Las Anod, uh, where there was a crisis going on uh, with the Somaliland region for the past uh, one year and a half, uh, where al Shabaab eventually became. So that uh, also what happened, Somali government was using that uh, small uh, militias to as a proxy to destabilize Somalia so that they can bring them for to force them unification. So China, uh, who's uh, uh, Somalia, as you know, is uh, uh, recognized and partner with a uh, Taiwan, and 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 this is where it gets interesting that uh, uh, China is tried to bully Somalia and didn't work. So now what they have done is now let's try to bankroll and support some of these militia. We're talking about some of the things have been reported diplomatically. Uh, was they they gave them somewhere about three to four million dollars, and aid through that. So so they don't nobody kind of understanding. Another thing China is doing is um, part of the illegal. Um, legalizing the illegal fishing right in Somalia so in Somalia what they have done with the current government they and the previous government they uh, they've asked uh, for example uh, a fishing license uh, that is worth 300 million to 400 million dollars for uh, just 2 million dollar in exchange so this is was and why they are doing that is and, and and basically just to take advantage of the Somalia case. Unfortunately, some and despite uh, not giving aid, for example, if you compare the United States government had been giving uh, one billion dollar to Somalia to development and aid, but uh, China have not even given them uh, Somalia even ten million dollar for a year. So one will ask you see how aggressive china is kind of going maybe using uh bribing government officials that what they this is a new phenomenon that started is just to counter uh us and see where they can counter taiwan or us interest in the region and in addition also uh, for example iran is also somehow they are barely working or indirectly working for example iran uh, one of their uh, one of the sanctioned uh, individual who's a, a Somali is called uh, Abdel Nasser Ali Adon, um, uh, who's been sanctioned by Saudi government, the UAE government, who's an Iranian agent, bankrolled uh, the current uh, the Somalia uh, president uh, Hassan Sheikh, who's a Muslim Brotherhood. Um, his election campaign. Now he's getting, uh, according to the uh, reports, we are getting that he's getting a deal, fishing deal, license deal. Uh, uh, from the government. So now you have Iranian elements uh, who are sanctioned uh, and a Chinese government who, who were illegally trying to get the fishing license in Somalia. So the question is, so where so where US government is not taking action or in, um, 
partnering or pushing and proposing some kind of a policies or trade, uh, China and Iran will exploit always. And that is what's happening. That's great. That's great. I don't see any more questions here from our uh, from our audience. So I'm going to wrap things up now. But if I wasn't able to get to you or you think of another question off the call, please email them to me at thalverson at mei.edu. I'd be happy to send them to Goulet or Moret uh, so they can answer them via email at a later time. I hope you'll join me in thanking both Moret and Goulet for participating in another insightful Red Sea briefing. We really appreciate your willingness to share your Friday morning with us. If you've missed any of our sessions or want to watch them again, you can find our recordings and transcripts of all our briefings on our landing page, www.mei.edu slash briefing dash series. That's www.mei.edu slash briefing dash series. Thanks again for joining us today and be on the lookout for an email invitation for next week's briefing, which we hope to distribute on Monday afternoon. If you find these calls valuable and want to learn more about other resources MEI can provide, don't hesitate to reach out. We'd be more than happy to connect. Wish you all the best and hope you have a great weekend.